Hello again, welcome back to the day, another week of daily Bible study. We're continuing on with the book of Acts. We are in chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 7. Uh, before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we thank you that you are the one who paves the way in our lives. And uh, we're going to read about your servant Paul, who's going to be moving very quickly toward his arrest and ultimately to his death. Uh, Lord, help us to see it with your eyes. Help us understand what we can take from it. Help us to, to, to learn what we need to learn. And help us always to keep you first in our lives. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so we pick it up here, and uh, so Paul has been on his way um, towards Jerusalem. And we talked last week about several times where people were saying, hey, watch out, Paul, you're going to be, uh, dangerous is waiting for you there and all the rest. And we're going to kind of see that side of Paul's interactions come to a culmination here. So this is what we read. When, the, we, had fin when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard, heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. So I want to highlight here, we're getting closer and closer to, um, to Jerusalem. Um, I'm not sure where, where Ptolemaeus is, but I do know that, the, that Caesarea is right on, on the, the cusp of um, you know, the northern uh, side of Israel. Um, that Jesus ended up in uh, Caesarea, Philippi, like right, right, it's right outside. And uh, so there's that. So I want to highlight the fact that Paul is really getting closer and closer and closer. And um, just like, you know, for Jesus getting to the heart of, of Judaism uh, was where kind of that conflict between the ways of God and the, the religious ways of human beings came to a climax in the same way we're going to see this with Paul. So that's important to, to remember and see. Um, I also want to highlight the fact they're saying with Philip, who's described as being one of the seven, and um, we are meant to understand by that that Philip is one of those original deacons. Uh, Stephen was another one of the deacons, and Stephen was uh, stoned to death, as we read earlier in Acts. So this guy Philip is really one of, you know, he's one, one, not one of the 12, uh, but he's in that next group of leaders, and, and it talks about him as being a prophet. So once again, I just want to remind you how interesting that deacon development has been because the deacons were originally commissioned as being their deacons because they're not the apostles. The apostles, and the distinction was the apostles are spending their time focusing on ministry of the word, and the deacons were there to handle the temporal affairs of the church, to, to distribute the food, uh, to do the works of mercy, and all the rest. And yet, here we have this very same Philip, who's one of the seven, and what's he doing? He's a prophet. Like, that's what he does. He spends his time doing, you know, doing the work of a prophet, which is absolutely, definitely uh, a ministry of the word. So we do see that already, even when, even when God designates, even when the people designate someone saying, you, your responsibility is everything but the ministry of the word, even still God calls them out of that. We saw it with Stephen. The first martyr was someone who was, was stoned to death because of his ministry of word, even though he was literally commissioned to everything but. We see the same, so we see the same thing with this prophet, uh, Philip. So we can go down, and we have this, this other prophet named Agabus comes down. Comes down, we, we oftentimes think about down as being going south from the north. Uh, coming down, in this case, is from Judea up to the north. Uh, you always come down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is on, a, is on Mount Zion, and so everything is coming down from there. Um, just like I understand, like with Oxford, you always go up to Oxford, no matter where you're coming from geographically. Um, so in the same way, this guy comes up and he takes Paul's belt and binds himself with it and says, uh, the man who owns this belt is going to be bound if he goes to Jerusalem. And so we really have this climax. We've seen it several times and all the rest. And I, and last week I suggested the possibility that maybe Paul, you know, if, if we, to the degree we can say that there's one and per, one perfect plan that, that is where God, what God wants, as long as we recognize that God can do stuff with all manner of things. Um, that uh, that is possible that Paul was was not listening to God, but was in fact, um, you know, doing something else. Like he was kind of he had something in his ideas in his head. He was going for it, regardless of whether it was what God really wanted him to do at that particular moment. Now, God 
didn't have God's hands tied. God still did all kinds of things. So on the one hand, you could say that maybe this passage un undermines that interpretation. Maybe it says that, uh, no, clearly this is what God wants Paul to do, and he's moving that direction. And, uh, you know, the story is either, I, you know, the, the one angle is saying that Paul has been ignoring God's repeated messages of stay away from Jerusalem, stay away from Jerusalem, or it's a story of Paul staying steadfastly per, uh, pursuing what God wants him to do even when everybody else wants him to do something different. And I don't know how we, as those outside of the situation, can tell for sure which one it is. Um, but I do notice, again, that what Paul's answer here is he says, you know, he, first of all, he says he does care about what these other people say. He does care that they don't want him to die. In fact, it makes him sad that he's making them sad. Um, he says, why are you breaking my heart over this? And, and he says, I am willing... I am, I'm ready to not only be bound, but to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And on the one hand, we can say, look, this is Paul being singularly focused on what God has for him. And on one level, that's, that very well may be true. But the point is, it is also indistinguishable, I think, uh, from Paul saying, this is what I want to do. I'm going to go do this for the Lord. And so it's just one of those things where every once in a while I find in my own life or in the life of other people, I have some people interpreting things one way, and I go, I don't know that if I see it that way. Well, the fact of the matter is, I don't know if I see it that you know agree with Paul on what he's doing. Um, or at least I see a place where the very same actions and words and all the rest could be compatible with two very different interpretations. And so I just think it's, for me at least, this is a, an eye-opening moment where if something is not 100% clear, even with the life of Paul, then maybe it's okay that it's not 100% clear in my life or in the life of somebody else that I'm talking to. Um, and it's a reminder that even if the worst case scenario is that Paul's doing this out of his own volition and not necessarily directly because God's called him to do it. And yet, it's also a reminder to say, look what God, if that's the case, and it may not be, but if that's the case, then the message here is to say, look at what God is able to accomplish even when Paul is not doing what he's supposed to do, even when Paul's not listening, even when those other things are going on. And so on the one hand, if Paul's being faithful to God, we can say, look, this is what happens when God's faith, when people are faithful to God. And even if Paul's not being faithful. It says, look at how God is not willing to let the stuff that God has done uh, fall to nothing. That God is still in, engaged in the redemption, even of those things. So regardless of which way it is, it doesn't change the fundamental idea that God is faithful and God is good. And I just, I think it's fascinating, even this kind of climactic moment of that, where it all kind of comes to a crescendo, that regardless of which way we read it, Neither one of them undermines the value of what God's doing. Neither one of them undermines the value of what Paul's doing. So for me, what I take away from this is it's a reminder of saying um, that when I see this in my life or in the life of other people or people in my congregation or just people I hear about and all the rest, I should remember that um, sometimes the words and actions could go one of two different directions. And I might see it, I may see it one way, someone else may see it another way, and that's okay. It's okay. We don't have to interpret it the same way. I might be convinced that someone's wrong, and they may be convinced that I'm wrong, but it doesn't really matter because so long as we're continuing to try to do our best to follow God, God is going to use that and maybe even do it in some ways that are very powerful that we wouldn't have expected. Well, that's all for today. Come back tomorrow. We'll have more of the Book of Acts. Have a good day.